Hi everyone, let's get started by looking at a technical overview and manipulation of images within CS5. Uh, here we're going to cover proper file structure, basic page setup, mirroring images, uh, liquify warp and clone tools, drawing an elevation and then transferring that to other views, uh, creating a scale silhouette for reality comparison, and creating a color board from images to be used as part of the color palette for concepting in CS5. Let's start with uh, proper file structure. Uh, one of the things I do is I like to set up a base folder system that just sits on my desktop and I can rename elements within that folder setup uh, when I start a project. Um, so right off the bat let's start with creating a uh, folder named main projects and this can end up anywhere later on but for now your desktop is perfect. Uh, in, in that project folder we're going to start a subfolder. Uh, I'm calling mine C77 projects uh, with three digits and then the start date in brackets. And basically if I get up to 100 projects this year I'll be really excited. Um, and uh, of course today's date as your start date. Uh, inside that folder we're going to have uh, several other subfolders. We're going to have a context library, CS5 concept sketches, final images for print, Z projects, Z tools, Z work in progress images. Um, these three at the bottom are pretty self-explanatory. All our work from ZBrush will be broken up and going into these three folders. Um, context library is uh, essentially a set of images that I'm going to have you photograph and use as context for the development of our character throughout this process. Uh, CS5 concept sketches, uh, anything that we create in Photoshop including the raw PSD files or JPEGs that we export or create from those images will go here during our first week as we uh, develop you into super designers. And uh, final images for print. When we're completed this process we can select images from any one of these areas and create a set of final images to be used um, for ourselves or for sale or, or whatever purpose you wish. Um, let's have a look at uh, other subfolders uh, in the context library. I'd like you to set up these subfolders as well. This is how we're going to break up the development of our character or create a base for the development of our character. Uh, at the top we have uh, B-B tech. That is basically brains or brawn technology. Uh, we have body forms, camo or camouflage, clothing, color swatches, culture, ecology, environmental, eye, gravity, predator or prey, uh, reproduction, scale figures, and the weirding way. And we're going to get into the weirding way later on. So if you can set this up, have it on your desktop, and then uh, we'll start to go through uh, in more detail um, what, we're, what we're going to prepare to put in these folders. Okay, let's look at basic page setup within Photoshop. Uh, we're going to go File, New, and uh, let's talk about what the size of your starting image should be for concepting. Um, my suggestion is you go as large as you possibly can and the highest DPI possible that doesn't slow down your machine. Um, and one of the reasons for that is if your concepts actually turn out to be viable um, in terms of a printable component, you're going to want a great DPI there for us to, to, to create your image and have that assailable piece of uh, artwork. So I like to keep mine fairly high. For me it's either 24 or 36 by 36 inches at uh, 300 or up to 600 dpi. Uh, and I'll just put mine at 6 and we're, we're going to start here. In terms of um, pixel dimensions we're up to 21 or 22,000 by 22,000 and that's pretty good. This is a fairly large um, screen resolution to begin with. Uh, and as, if this is going to be our base concepting page, let's go to File, Save As, uh, and to our main projects folder. And in this, let's start a uh, CS5 concept sketches. Let's save this as concept one. And that's going to be our start. Let's look at quickly mirroring images within Photoshop. Um, you can grab any image and open it up for now um, and just follow along here. So we have a basic image. Normally when they're brought in or opened they're going to have they're going to be locked. So this image is going to have this symbol here and it's going to be locked off. You won't be able to manipulate it. Um, these uh, transform controls will not show up on a locked image. So you can uh, essentially right click on top of that image while it's highlighted. Duplicate the layer 
Select OK, and now you'll have two. This bottom one, which will appear locked, you can actually just toss that in the trash. And now this becomes uh, an image we can manipulate. Uh, so we can take this. While the marquee controls are visible and the, the layer is active, you can drag from the ruler section over here and just pull a guideline right into the middle. Grab your square marquee tool and select half of this image and it'll snap to your guideline. Uh, you start it at the corner and pull it down and it'll snap to the guideline. And then uh, while that's uh, selected and while this layer is selected, you can press Control J. Control J will instantly duplicate the section which you've selected and now it's available. To flip that, let's just go over to Edit, Transform, and Flip Horizontal and now you've flipped that side. Um, this technique is necessary to know uh, as we move forward basically because it helps us to quickly bisect images graphically, create a little Rorschach from any image that we want, and we can start to perceive uh, the information in this image much differently uh, than we would have if we had left it alone. So this begins our ability to manipulate uh, inside of Photoshop. Alright, let's continue on here. Let's take a look at the liquify tool uh, in Photoshop. Uh, now we, we mirrored a section of this image over to create this sort of Rorschach uh, effect in a uh, uh, any image, and particularly this cloud image, and we have something interesting going on. But to affect um, sort of this whole uh, image, we've got to collapse the layers. So let's uh, click on the active one, merge down so that we have one layer. Let's remove the guide. And you can do that by dragging it over to the ruler, or you can go to View and select Clear Guides. Once this is um, merged together and it's selected in the layer palette, uh, you can also tell that because the transform controls are visible on the outside edge of the image, uh, we can go into Liquify. So it's Filter, Liquify, and another uh, palette is going to come up showing the image with a set of tools on the right and a set of brushes on the left. Well, let's just go over some of these on the right. Um, we have uh, some brush uh, details here, brush size, density, pressure, brush rate. These are uh, sort of self-explanatory. Um, brush size, of course, will uh, increase the diameter of your brush. Density uh, affects the uh, how, how many of the pixels within that brush uh, diameter it affects. Uh, brush pressure, if you're using a stylus, uh, it can affect the um, selection process uh, by placing more pressure on the tablet. Uh, brush rate um, is a speed, so how quickly it affects the uh, changes to the image. Um, turbulent will add a bit of uh, um, turbulence to the changes uh, that you make using whichever brush, uh, so it'll affect it in a more uh, varied way. Um, and we have our revert options here, so we can reconstruct or restore all back to the original image. Um, reconstruct is sort of a click-by-click uh, reconstruction. Restore all is right back to the beginning. We have our masking options. None, mask all, invert all. Uh, this will uh, sort of, uh, we'll get into this a little bit more, but it allows us to affect uh, the masks on our page. Uh, we have show image, which will show the image in our layer system, which we are uh, uh, trying to affect, and show mesh as well. This will show the sort of the math behind the uh, use of the brush. I find this a little distracting so I don't have it on very much but essentially it is um, the mesh that it uses to warp the image. Um, show mask, we want that on so that when we do select a mask, brush and paint that we can see uh, what is being protected and it gives you some mask options here. Um, I'm going to clear that by going none. Um, Show backdrop. This brush actually, if I actually show image, if I click that off, you can see in the background sort of ghosted uh, a ghosted image of the original. And what it does is it keeps a um, uh, an image of the original in the background at a particular opacity, uh, so that you can track your changes. So I use, this is usually set at 50. Um, you can move that protected layer to the front behind, or you can do a blend. Uh, you can show all your layers from uh, your original layer stack in Photoshop, uh, or it, it's, losing, it's selecting all layers because I only have one, but if I had many, I could I could select a particular I a layer I wanted to see in the background. We're gonna take this and turn it off, and we're just gonna show the image which we're going to manipulate. Uh, up here on the left, you have uh, our brushes. 
and this one is called uh, forward warp tool or it's shortcut W on the keypad. Let's just uh, reduce the size of this and I'm going to show you what it does. It actually grabs pixels and allows you to pull them around. It is not a, a, a blend brush. It's not a uh, smudge brush. It doesn't really blend pixel coloration together. It actually moves them around and, uh, and, and it uh, maintains uh, the sort of pixel integrity. So all of the uh, pixels are still there, they're just compressed and changed. And that is the effect of having this done on a, on a mesh system. Um, and once it's done, if you like that image, you can exit out by selecting OK, and this will be, uh, f this will be transferred to your um, layer in the layer stack. Um, f for this test, I'm just going to just restore all back to normal. Um, we have the reconstruct tool. So if I do uh, do make some changes and I want to reconstruct the image, I can do that on a click by click basis here, uh, just to you know, restore certain elements of my image with a little bit more control. You can also press reconstruct, which affects the entire uh, set of history and changes, or restore all, which will bring this back to normal. Um, we have the uh, twirl clockwise tool, and this uh, essentially twirls the pixels in a clockwise direction, starting from the center of your brush um, and working its way out towards the edge of the brush. So you can see that it, it twirls that, and we're getting sort of a galaxy shape. The more you move, the more it does it, and the faster it can go. Um, and it creates some very interesting effects. Um, I believe if you press Alt, it changes the direction, yeah. There we go. So now you can you can actually create some pretty interesting effects um, uh, just with these two tools. And when we get back into, or if you select uh, OK and uh, go back into your main layer stack in Photoshop and mirror this, you're going to find you get some very interesting effects as well. So this is a, a fine tool to use in terms of photo manipulation. Let's just restore that back to normal as well. Um, we also have the pucker tool. Now, the pucker tool is, is essentially a pinch brush, uh, very similar to what's happening in, in ZBrush. Um, and it allows us to pull pixels together or shrink certain aspects of the image. So if we wanted our eyes smaller or our nose smaller or uh, areas which we felt were, were those objects, we could, we could actually increase or, or, or decrease the size. Uh, if you press Alt, it reverses that process uh, and you get something more akin to the bloat tool, which we're going to look at next. Let's restore that. So the bloat tool as well. Uh, this bloat tool does what uh, Alt does for pinch, and it basically just uh, expands the pixels again without destroying them, but it keeps them within the confines of the diameter of the brush and allows you to expand areas. So you can imagine this as a an eye getting larger, a nose getting larger, a portion of the, the image being expanded uh, to increase that, that size, that inflation in that area. Um, and it, acts as a very interesting tool uh, and again you can you can press alt and and uh, just pinch those elements together let's restore that back um, this one here push left we have oh, I'm still I'm still in bloat let's go to push left restore that push left it actually just drops pulls pixels from the one side of the brush to the other and really just collapses them. If you press Alt, it changes direction. Um, it's pretty good. You can really affect uh, your image uh, in a harsh way doing this. Um, brush size is high. Brush density is high. Let's just change that down to something like 12. And you can see it, it just affects it slower. Let's change that right down to zero. Yeah, it makes a mess in a hurry. You can give that a try. Um, this is one that I don't use that often, but it's there. Uh, and in certain situations, will certainly um, alter your image uh, quickly. Now, the mirror tool here in, in Liquify is not something that I use often. But if you click in one area, press Shift, and click in another, you can affect it in a straight line. And it essentially um, mirrors um, 
the image from uh, outside the brush to the inside of the brush. Uh, it's something that uh, I haven't played with much, but um, it does change the image quite dramatically. And uh, I'm certain we can use it somewhere. Let's reduce the size of the brush down. Let's see what we can get. Interesting. Um, for affecting the large areas of the image, I prefer the sort of manual method in uh, the main Photoshop GUI here. But this is very uh, this is very interesting. I'm going to keep this in mind for our next uh, test. All right, let's restore that, and uh, let's go to this uh, turbulence tool. We're going to increase the size of the brush over here on the right, so we can really see what's going on. Um, and you can start to see that it just creates this turbulent shape. And you can drag it a little bit, but when you leave it leave it in a single spot and just activate the brush, it really does begin to uh, act like you're looking through glass, and it warps the uh, image in that way, causing a lot of uh, well turbulence in the image, um, acting like wind and really, really, really distorting what's there. It's interesting, and it could be used to create some fun effects, uh, particularly in um, portraits. Let's just reduce that size down and restore all. Um, now we have the masking tools. For areas that we don't want to have affected, we can we can actually protect portions of our image. Uh, we can turn the brush density back to 50, and brush size, we're going to reduce this down to 151. And uh, we can just brush areas that we, that we want to maintain uh, and keep unaffected. You know, say we like this sort of area here. Um, if you press Alt, it allows you to erase, and essentially you're activating this brush here, the Thaw Mask tool. And uh, yeah, now we can grab uh, whichever brush we want to affect uh, the rest of the image, and the area underneath the red it will be fully protected. Uh, from these changes. So that area remains the same and it's only affecting areas outside of the mask, very much like masking in ZBrush. Um, you have none, you have mask all, invert. Um, so you have some, some options here to, uh, to control the masking within the liquify window. All right, let's revert that back. Uh, so we have masking and unmasking, essentially, and we have the hand tool. When you're close up and, and doing some changes which require you to be uh, really in-depth in the image, uh, the hand tool just allows you to um, to shift around. Let's just get in close. So the hand tool just allows you to move your image around so that you can uh, direct your changes specific to specific areas. And of course, the uh, uh, magnify tool allows you to magnify. Pressing Alt will allow you to come back out. So we're going to use this a little bit uh, as we get uh, um, a little more uh, in-depth in terms of uh, concepting within Photoshop and uh, using it to manipulate the photographs we take to find those interesting shapes uh, and sort of um, break things down to their simplest format so we can begin uh, developing some context for our characters. We'll just go back to our main window here. All right, let's let's explore a little bit about the warp tool in uh, Photoshop. Uh, the warp tool is something that I use to um, to create some overall shape changes in the image. Um, I sometimes use this before mirroring and uh, collapsing those layers so that I can just really globally change the the image itself before those operations and, and make some significant differences visually before I move forward. Well, let's show you what those are like. Um, we're going to want to make sure that the layer is collapsed and that we have that single layer uh, selected and that the transform controls are visible here. 
So once you once that's done, you can just scroll up to the side and it'll split into the double arrow. Tap that and you'll have a uh, selection of tools here uh, at your disposal. This is the warp tool. This allows you to switch between transform and warp modes. So let's just click that. It's going to drop a grid over top of your image with these uh, a set of controls here on the sides and of course you have access to your center or your corner controls as well from the um, from the selection. If we grab this and you can see that it's essentially an arm and it's connected to the corner of your image but you can drag this arm way over here. It affects the length uh, of your uh, transform operation so you can affect a small amount or you can increase the intensity of that change by dragging it uh, a little bit further and making it longer. Uh, you can also grab anywhere inside this grid and start changing the shape of elements here. Now there's an interesting form popping out uh, of that cloud formation so I'm just going to play with it a little bit. Uh, you can drag these corners and pull them right in and it's almost as if you're pulling the page uh, pulling the page uh, over and turning turning that corner in on itself um, and it literally is uh, a wonderful way to just change the overall forms uh, within this within this image. So you can start to affect um, this entire image pretty quickly and in broad strokes um, using this warp tool functionality. Once you have uh, some changes to this that you like then you can press enter and accept those changes and it's going to drop it back onto your uh, page size here and it's going to expose the transparent background. That's not a big deal. Um, we can still use this in every other operation um, that we've talked about so far and in the ones that we're going to look at. Um, but I like to, to keep it tidy and full size. So we're going to create a new layer by pressing the layer button at the bottom, drop it to the back side and we're going to go to the fill bucket, select a color off of the image and fill that background. Now it's just a, a solid image. Let's take this uh, and merge down. Uh, make sure that it's selected and that the transform controls are visible. And let's drop a line somewhere here which we believe to be center of, our, of the uh, sort of graphic pattern we want to duplicate. I like that for now. So with this layer selected we can go to our rectangular marquee tool, select the side we like, control J. With that new uh, layer selected. We can go to edit, transform, flip horizontal, and take this side that we like and drop it right here in the center. And now we have a, you know, a uh, accurately bisected uh, image that we can start to play with. Uh, and there's some nice forms coming out of that that we can begin to build off of. Um, and there you go. This is a, a really good example of um, how the warp tool can adjust uh, our image globally and get us some new uh, shapes to play with in our character creation. Hi everybody, let's take a look at the clone tool in Photoshop. Um, I've reopened our sky image but as you notice it's uh, now labeled background image and it's locked off. These controls at the top of our layer palette are no longer available to us. They're grayed out. So unlocking this becomes a little difficult. Uh, one of the things that I do in a shortcut that uh, I try is just to duplicate that layer. Select OK. You can change the name here if you wish but it's alright just to leave it as is. And then select this locked layer and just throw it in the trash. We don't need that. Uh, now that we have this available to us, when the move brush is active you can see the transform controls are all available to us on the outside perimeter of the image and uh, now we can start uh, changing this at will. Let's grab a ruler or a guideline from off of our rulers here and drop it in the center. Now it should snap to that uh, control. If it doesn't, just go into view and just make sure it's, uh, snap is checked off. Uh, if your rulers aren't visible, you can also go to view and show and here uh, your guides. You want to check that off so that these guides are available. When you right click over the guide, uh, you'll have a, a option to set this as either pixel, inches, centimeters, millimeters, or whatever you like in terms of uh, gauge of measurement. Pixels is fine for us. Um, with this now selected, we can choose the side we want to bisect. Uh, and as before, we're going to select the rectangular marquee tool. We're going to control J to duplicate that image 
uh, or that portion of the image and then we're going to select edit transform or edit sorry transform and flip horizontally now that moves uh, flips it uh, horizontally we're going to apply it and drop it over to our other side now we have that mirrored nicely and let's just merge that down uh, we no longer need the or for this next test we really don't need the street and the houses so let's just go to our crop tool and drag this down to here so that this is uh, the only thing we're concerned with let's go back to our move tool and drag the guide off because we no longer need that as well um, over here on the side you'll see the clone stamp tool so we have the clone stamp and it works in a very interesting way it allows us to uh, sample areas of the uh, photograph and then apply it uh, anywhere else that we want so when we see areas of the uh, image that we want to duplicate or that we want to add a detail somewhere inside this this form you can just grab that and quickly lay a stroke on the palette and drop that detail in. Clouds are interesting, they, they create some really freeform uh, shapes and let us kind of uh, access, um, I don't know, a different part of our brain or a different different way to see, right? And once that's done we can redo a, um, a mirroring operation or we can just accept this as a change. I just wanted to make you aware of something as well. When we when we select an instance of the background and we press on the screen you'll see that X appear um, where we selected and it's moving with our with our stroke so you're not necessarily stamping a single instance uh, of the of the image you're you're duplicating uh, stroke by stroke uh, that area of the canvas and that can become uh, pretty cool if you want a simple instance just tap once and leave your opacity at 100 percent you can drop your opacity down and just begin to develop uh, uh, more subtle changes and kind of blend off those those uh, instances a little bit more and then we can go back with this now worked on our copy uh, go to the move tool so that center uh, transform control is available to us drop the marquee in control J to duplicate uh, take this over to the side and you can do the edit operation or you can now grab these controls and snap it to the other edge and snap this one to the center and uh, just bring it into alignment and press enter to select those transform changes and now we have some interesting shapes being developed here in the middle of the image um, you can accept those and merge them down into a brand new image and we'll move on to our next step. Alright guys, let's take a look at creating elevations in Photoshop and transferring views uh, from this elevation to a plan view, uh, reflected uh, plan view or the bottom, and a side elevation. One of the things that um, I do is just um, coming from a drafting background uh, and using Photoshop makes this really, really quick. Um, one of the things uh, that I start with is just drawing up a set of guides and it's really basic uh, line work uh, which projects out from the outside edges of your object and uh, so in this way you can transfer information up to our next view in terms of total outside shape or profile. Um, the reason I don't run all of my lines through the top for the top view uh, is because it becomes awfully messy when everything is projected in one direction. When you can project sort of uh, elements from the bottom down and the elements from the top up, it just cleans up the page a little bit and makes transferring a little bit easier. Um, once you have once you have this laid out, your next step is to create a 45 degree guide uh, on the top and bottom that will help refract information over the next side view. Um, so we have two 45 degree angles and what I did was just draw a straight line and then rotate it to 45 degrees uh, and I have it on two separate layers just because we have a bottom and a top refraction going on here. And let me illustrate that a little bit. Let me just make a test layer here. just do a test layer. Um, when you, for example, if we go to the top view here and we 
we draw a line from from the our object up, and then we we draw a crossing line or an angle perpendicular to that straight through our 45 degree uh, indicator. That that information, that little cross that happens, is a positional marker. If you run a vertical line through there, right through to the bottom, now you have uh, an object or an indicator of the center of this object running through our next view basically refracted off of this top plane and the bottom plane. And these meet up bang on perfectly. So now that you have a center mark established, you can begin to transfer all this other information from your top view over. So we know the edge of our component um, is here and here. To complete this, we need to know what shape it is in our in our top view. And I've indicated here that it could be circular, but we're, we 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 want to do this as a triangle. So let's go to our polygonal maker here and uh, set the sides to three. Let's draw this out, and we know it's painting for or or pointing forward because we've got the tip here in our uh, elevation. Let's just bring this to the most outward markers that we've indicated on the side, and this shape is now created. Um, let's reduce that to something around 20-25% and uh, let's start a new layer and call that top view. Now with a triangle indicated there we can um, with this, uh, with this uh, triangle indicating the top view we can now just do uh, some line work. I'm just going to create sort of broad strokes here. In Photoshop I'm just going to run some lines through just so I can turn that off. It's a bit of a distraction. So we have our triangle uh, indicated roughly here. We know that the center has a button on it. Let's draw lines up to indicate sort of the diameter of our button and let's just throw a circle in there to indicate uh, that that is the uh, shape in our plan view. Now with this outermost edge established we can begin to draw our lines over and as long as they cross our refraction plane we can start running this down this way. So now we know that the top in this new side view which is this view transferred here uh, we know that it is this wide, that it is that wide, and this is the indication of the center mark. Um, we can do the same thing with our button location. Let's drop that down. We know that the button takes up this thickness, so we can drop that in there. And we know that our most outward edge is here, so on our next level down, indicated by these two markers, we can we can decide, uh, we can just draw in here that that is the thickness there. Now there is a little cove here so we can we can bring this up and we can bring this up as an indication of where those inside corners are but we really can't do it here. What we can do though is draw a line through and then bring this in so we roughly know where this inside corner is going to be and then we can bring that down. And we know our cove is roughly that deep in this view. And that at the back, the cove is roughly here. Now with that indicated, we can continue on drawing our lines. We know that these uh, this lower detail shares roughly the uh, dimension of our upper uh, form, so we can draw that in and I'm just going to go ahead and fill this in so I know that it's an indentation. Uh, and now we have this section here. We want to know where to start and where to finish and again we can transfer both of those up here but we have to remember that this is a triangle so once again we are creating an inner triangle just to show where those are and we can transfer those details over have them refract down to our next position. So we have a starting indication and a f starting indication and a finishing indication. 
So that will go there. And that will come down here, and this is our finishing, our finishing, and our starting. We know it comes roughly to the outside edge here, but let's just make sure. Yeah, roughly there, and that brings it across to there. And now we have this thickness. Same th same depth as our most outer points, so we're going to keep those, but we're just going to fill in that space so that we're aware of what it is. Now these details here, if you add lots of details into the pieces, all of those points can be transferred up and over. You just have to put the, um, the transfer lines and this refracting lines on a different layer to kind of keep this clean. We're just going to go ahead and fill it in roughly. So I'm just going to indicate that it is a detail. Normally I would let my props guys decide what that actually is um, and give them sort of the broad strokes. Um, we have that uh, indicated now. We have a main thickness that we want to transfer. This is getting kind of messy. Let's just, let's just pull that down and let's pull this one down here. Uh, and we know that that is also a triangle so let's bring up our other triangular shape created the same way as the top. We're using a shape layer to develop a triangle there and it fits our most outward uh, dimension and then we can transfer that over and we can transfer that line over and that gives us our thickness, our overall thickness of this lower scroll case area and that drops right down to this area here. So we have that shape indicated. We have another detail here indicated. We have a cove indicated here and we could do that transfer as well if we wanted to be crazy accurate that would be that. And I think this is this is indicating uh, another point, another triangle inside that. So we're just going to create another triangle inside. That would be the, the sort of cove, the inside, uh, the most inside point of that convex shape. And let's transfer that over here as well. And that over here as well. So we have cove one and cove two. Here. So we have the back and the front of that triangular section. And now this new triangle, which is this one, here and here, which we've indicated, we're going to bring it over. That's our starting section. And it all comes to a point, which begins here, which is centered on our center mark right there. So our sort of spherical form at the bottom begins here. And it is the same diameter as spheres are all in both in all views. I'm going to bring that up and we're going to bring that up. And it's roughly that diameter. And then these points simply join together. create our shape. Mm, arrow there. Yep, so it's going to be that one. That's going to be that one actually. Mm, 
I'm sorry, it's just going to be completely flat. Like that. Just remembering what a triangle actually looks like. That's going to go there. It's completely flat on the back side, so it runs straight up like that. And our circle is there, like so. And you continue by adding other details. We know that this balls out at the edges and comes up. And that there are some scrolly details here. That this is slightly indented. And I'm just going to bring my opacity up so we can start to indicate these a little more clearly. So you're basically transferring information from one view to another by refracting their uh, guidelines using this 45 degree angle to the bottoms and the tops. Um, and this quickly, this allows me quickly to create basic views uh, for our uh, props group to fabricate from. And uh, I leave a lot to their discretion because you've got to trust the people who work for you to do the jobs they're trained to do. And I give some pretty broad strokes, uh, but the guys do a fantastic uh, job um, just taking uh, this information and uh, going for it. So um, Once you have it in all these views, these, these uh, tabs are very interesting. There's an interesting challenge there because they're on a unique angle. They're facing back based on the center point of the uh, through the center point and through the corners like that. And we know that they're this long so we can now determine that they are uh, pointing towards center. We can decide how thick those objects are going to be and we can start transferring the thicknesses in that view and where they connect to this this piece here. So they're going to come all the way to here. They're going to come all the way to that point and then they're going to extend out from there indicated by our previous side view and they are going to terminate at this point. Now the thing we also have to have is we have a little cove here. So we know the cove is there. We should transfer the position of the cove over as well. So we know that that's going to be the cove. We know that this thickness is uniform through the piece so we're going to carry it down here as well. And that indicates our belt object. There you go. That's transferring information to other views using Photoshop. I'm just going to finish this off and you can, I'll finish this view and we can uh, just bring it up to a different level. I'm just going to take this information to drop it down in opacity a little bit. Start a new layer. This should be guides. I'm just going to rename this view guide since we've kind of blended all of our views together. And we're going to redraw over the top of this in a new layer uh, a little darker so that we can clean up what's here. Let's zoom into that. So we have this object. That, that tab there. We have a cove element. We have a 
slightly rounded detail here. And we have a under detail that wraps that curve. We have the tab, which is indicating a certain thickness here through the piece. And it breaks our profile because it's sitting on the corner, which is being indicated by this line here. We have a indentation. And then we have a element, which we could say is something like that, based on what it looks like. And we're going to, we know that we want some decorative piece here. Like so. This is our most outside shape. And our tab is indicated here. And we will just give this a little bit of cleanup. Well, and that's what you can do. You drop your guidelines down to a, you know, a viewable level, but something that is sort of not interfering with overall form creation here. And we just bring in those details, or up those details a little bit to clear, clear the air and understanding of what's going on. Missed a line there. And then these tabs, of course, are here. And I'm, you know, for me, I'm going to make those slightly more decorative. Yeah, so now it's just about tidying things up, making this all make sense uh, from one view to the next. So this process does help quite a bit in terms of clarifying what we're looking at. And we're going to get into this a little bit more as we start to develop um, what uh, our character's gear and things look like. but. It's necessary to understand it now uh, when we start to feel our way through the development of some of these uh, decorative pieces. Alright, so I'm going to turn this down a little bit. One of the things I like to do is just go back and add some add some washes just to indicate what's happening here inside the piece. And you could render this out more if you had time. But in terms of you know working out concepts and teaching you about uh, sort of transferring information from one view to another, I think that kind of does it. After you've tidied it up, we can just apply a dimension to this. Um, and sometimes this is all uh, I can all I have time to do with the amount of work that uh, we're we're putting through. We have our indicator lines here now, overall height. So we would bring sort of a dimension line in, 
and we tick those off so they know what we're talking about. I might just erase a little bit out of here and then I would say this is approximately 18 inches. And to scale, uh, based on provided dimension. And that might be my only note I have time to make. Um, when it gets to finishing painting and sort of developing a final uh, overall look, then the discussions get into a little more detail. And I like to leave those. So I'd rather I like to work with the crew to um, to to build a final look. And we have fantastic uh, scenic artists in our shop, and uh, um, they know more than I do and how to get there. So it's wonderful to work together to get a final uh, piece out the door. So something like that gives us um, enough information to start our um, to start fabricating uh, an element for our character in ZBrush. Um, so there you go, that is creating an elevation, transferring information to other views using Photoshop. All right, let's create a scale silhouette for reality comparison within Photoshop. As we create concepts here, we want to give our clients or ourselves an indication of scale and giving ourselves the capacity to shift that uh, um, scaling uh, silhouette or that uh, figure uh, gives us the capacity to to adjust the, the feeling of the object we've created, whether it's large and menacing or small and tiny. Um, so let's uh, quickly have a look. One of, one of the things that I have done uh, is take a photo, bring a photograph in of a, a figure and essentially go to images, adjustments, uh, hue and saturation and drop the lightness down to zero. And when you do that it basically turns everything black and you're left with just a silhouette. You'll have to do some trimming out if it's in a photograph but that is a quick way to, uh, to basically create a, a silhouette. Um, you could also hand draw one and I do this often when uh, I can't find my little guy, but all I'm doing is drawing black on white and just creating a shape that I can bring into a scene and scale up or down uh, depending on uh, the size of the figure I'm comparing this against. Um, you can also just change the proportions of that figure whenever necessary as well. And you can kind of create some some interesting shapes. It's just fun to do, but it must be in your images to give an indication of scale. Uh, I think it's important and uh, most of my clients expect uh, that kind of uh, detail. So it's good to have. Um, and let's here, let's just look at, at one. Let's control D that. Um, let's do some painting. So if we're bringing in, you know, if we're drawing something ourselves, uh, it could be as simple as, it doesn't have to be a figure, and I'll leave it up to you to how you indicate the scale. It's whatever really works for you, but let's let's work across. Um, one of the things I have done is, um, let's go to view and bring up, um, let's show our grid, and you can see our grid is here. What we're going to do is just draw directly over top of the large uh, grid lines. And let's say that this is floor level. Let me darken my lines up so we can see what's going on here. So that is my ground level. That is uh, my indication of height. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Let's say we're doing 10, 11, 12. Let's two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Yeah. So we've got this at 12. Um, one of the things that I have done uh, is basically create a, a little ruler for myself. We'll just blow this off uh, pretty quickly. Just create a scale indicator here. And uh, now that we have that marked out and it's based on an actual grid, we can go back to view and um, show and remove our grid and now we have this line here. Let's take our rectangular marquee tool and let's clean up some of that. We're just going to take it to the outside edges like so. A little tidying. 
Yeah, we can go a little more. Okay, like that. And then let's go to our fill button, select black, and just fill in every other one. Like so. So now that this is here, now we have sort of this as a uh, possible one foot indicator um, or a six inch indicator or whatever it is, whatever value you want to give to that. Uh, and you can note that at the bottom of your image. But it's here for us to check against. So right now this guy would be like 12 feet tall. And we would have to bring him down to what is realistic. So two, four, six feet tall. He would be roughly in that area and uh, this figure as well. We would drop this uh, lady figure down to under six feet. Um, you could do whatever you like. One of those three options is certainly available to you, but you must have one created uh, for us to continue on through this process and apply against the characters we create as an indication of uh, the scale of that figure. All right, let's keep that in mind as we roll forward and uh, you're free to prepare those at any time. All right, let's take a look at creating color boards from images. Um, I'm gonna bring an image in I've been working on and we're gonna select a palette of colors uh, from this image. Let's just size it up a little bit. This is the cheese head. Uh, it's a painting I'm working on for a client. Let's just crop that out so that it only shows uh, colors and then the computer is not considering so much white in its selection for a color palette. Um, and let's uh, merge that down. So we have this merge layer uh, with the painting uh, of color uh, that we like and we want to select a palette out of here and replace the swatch that we've got on the right hand side. Let's go to uh, image mode and then to index color. Now uh, a little table is going to come up here. Let's set this to 80 and 80 colors we want it selected out of this uh, out of this image. And let's look at the styles of palettes we have to choose from. There's system, Mac OS colors, Windows system colors, web safe colors, uniform colors. Let's take a look at that. This is basically a, a filtering system based on the RGB uh, values red, green, green, blue, and uh, it will pick 80 colors from that filtering system. Doesn't really work for us here, but it's important to note you can do that. Local perceptual, um, it uh, based on what the eye sees, this is the uh, sort of 80 colors that it's reducing our image to and will pick from. Um, local selective, there is going to be minor changes, kind of eliminates some detail, softens things a bit. Local adaptive, not much of a change, but um, if you like this uh, this value difference, you can certainly uh, choose it. Master perceptual, um, master selective, and master adaptive. These all give you further re uh, refined options for selecting colors within this image. Uh, we're going to leave this one at local perceptual. Uh, we're not going to force uh, certain selections, although you can choose black and white values or primaries, web, etc. And uh, we're not interested in grabbing a transparency at this point. We're including transparency in our selection. And now you can select OK. So it's made the adjustments and now we want to include that color palette here on the side. So we can go to um, Image, Mode, and color table. And you can see that it's created a palette of colors, of 80 colors selected from our image. And basically that's ready to go. Now you can save this and let's save it to the desktop in our main projects folder under the context library color swatches. Well, I have one here that we did before but let's uh, let's rename that Creature, creature two, creature two, 
and it saves as a .act file and select OK. Now up here in color swatches you can go to the uh, go to the side here and select this table and you'll find load swatches. And let's go back to our desktop into our main projects folder where we save this context library color swatches and uh, it's considering it's looking for a .aco at this point but we can change that to .act and here you have our two selections. Let's choose the one we just did, Creature 2, and load that. Now it's loaded it here at the bottom as well. But you can actually replace this entire palette with that selection only. So let's do that and let's go replace swatches and have it and we can select it, uh, reselect it. So we'll go back to the desktop main projects folder, into our context library, color swatches, ACT, select creature 2, load, and that will be replaced entirely. So you can either add color selections to a current color palette, or you can replace it entirely through this table on the right hand side uh, for your color swatch collection. There you go. And you have others to choose from, Pantones, etc. Uh, I hardly ever use these. I, I generally find photographic uh, reference that uh, of landscapes um, that I like uh, from nature that have a clearly uh, uh, defined color palette and uh, I grab colors from those to develop uh, a painting with a similar mood uh, or a feeling that, that that was captured in that photograph so that's how I start and we can do this uh, as many times as you want save as many color swatches uh, as you like um, and that palette uh, that you create will be available to you when we begin uh, creature concepting.